there, due to a last-minute emergency, Lisa Signorello could not be with us today, but technology came to the rescue. She voiced her presentation and sent it to us. Lisa is currently serving as Deputy Director in the Cancer Prevention Fellowship Program at the Division of Cancer Prevention at NCI. She will talk to us about the time-honored ethos, mentoring in the method of Dimitrios Trikopoulos. Thank you to Michelle and to the school for conceiving of this really well-deserved tribute to Demetrius, and I'm sorry that I couldn't be there in person today. It would be wonderful to be in a place and hear so many people talk about Demetrius's distinguished career in public health and his extraordinary contributions to our institutions and to our understanding of cancer, and also to talk about what an extraordinary person that he was. Demetrius has been called a giant in cancer epidemiology, and I think the fact is that he was a giant and in that way, but in so many other respects. For many of us, he was the pivotal person in our professional and even personal growth. He was our mentor, and through the example that he set, his legacy includes the creating of another generation of mentors to carry this forward. And so I'd like to talk about that because Particularly in my current position, I find myself reflecting a lot on what it takes to be a good mentor and how to bring up a new group of mentors into the field of cancer prevention and control. And I can tell you that it isn't nearly as easy as he made it seem. Many of you know that in 2009, Demetrius was awarded the HSPH Alumni Award of Merit. And we on this panel were among the ones who nominated him for this award. And I was recently able to go back and find my letter of nomination from that period. Demetrius was a scientific pioneer, and for that alone he deserved this alumni award. But I found when putting pen to paper that what I really wanted to say was what an amazing mentor he was. And so from my letter, the part I'd specifically like to share with you is on this slide, that Demetrius allowed us to contribute to all of the collaborative work that we did as an equal to him, which was an, an amazing and, and very rare trait, as far as I can tell, in a mentor, that he included us in all sorts of scientific endeavors well outside of our thesis work, and that that broadened and refined our expertise, and it afforded us the opportunity to work with really experienced investigators throughout the world, many of whom I know are in this room today. He was very generous in giving us credit and recognition for work, and that his whole approach to mentoring was an extraordinary model for us, and it resulted in us graduating with the skills and the confidence that we needed to immediately bark on, embark on whatever it is we wanted to do. So to be sure, I do owe Demetrius a very large debt for passing on to me the skills that I have today and the understanding that I too should continue the tradition of helping to develop young investigators the best I can. So I hope that tells you a little bit about what it was like to have such a giant as a mentor, and not only that, but a giant who also happened to be a humble and a generous and a truly good human being, and that that kind of a mentor instills confidence, instills self-possession, and instills a security that so we're comfortable reaching out to the world scientific community and joining forces with them, because that was our model and making the most of these new opportunities to build important collaborative work, not in competition with cross-institutional groups, but in genuine collaboration that for Demetrius and for us nearly always resulted in long-term friendships. When we left Demetrius's mentorship and left Harvard, we felt prepared to contribute, prepared to respond to challenges, prepared to bring our science to the world, whether that's Hannah here um, talking about poverty and disability at the EU Parliament, or the many, many other ways 
that we disseminate our work and advance our field. And when I was approached in 1999 to help develop a new cohort study shown here on this slide, the Southern Community Cohort Study, it didn't even occur to me that I was too junior to pull that off um, or that I hadn't even written an NIH grant or never worked with dozens of community partners. And some of that may have been, you know, the naivete that comes with youth, but I still have it. and. I still know that there's nothing that I can't accomplish, and I still know that there's nothing that I can't build, and I can tell you that that comes from him. I want to go back to a, a little piece of the nomination letter that I showed you a minute ago, and that's the, the part about understanding that I, too, should continue the tradition of helping to develop young investigators the best I can. I wrote that in 2009, completely unaware that five years later I would really n need to make good on that promise, um, that I'd have my hands full with all 40 of these guys. These are the Cancer Prevention Fellows at NCI, and I'm the Deputy Director of their four-year training program. Our fellowship is a four-year research and leadership training program for scientists that come from a wide range of disciplines, but who all want to focus their research on some aspect of cancer prevention and control. At NCI, they choose primary preceptors with whom they work on a daily basis to complete their projects. Um, they also work with myself and our director on a daily basis as what I guess you could call home-based mentors. and. So what my day involves really is, 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 day after, is day after day of mentoring and I help the fellows to develop scientific research ideas, I help them develop strategies for research portfolios, for career development, I'm responsible for understanding their gaps, their skill gaps, and helping to fill those with programming for, say, grant writing, team and leadership skills, scientific writing, public speaking. And we're also here just for advice. Um, as a fellow, sometimes you fall down and you just need to be picked up and brushed off. And it's a really big responsibility I found in a really large time commitment and I love every minute of it. There's a lot of personal satisfaction that comes from watching your mentees reach their full potential and from helping that them succeed. And I found that in academia and I'm finding that here at NCI. And I'm, I'm seeing that some of the things I'm gaining from these relationships are the same as what Demetrius would talk about. Michelle, I'm, I'm sure you remember interviewing Demetrius for the Voices video for epidemiology, and you asked him, what person would you single out as having had the most strong influence in your career? And he answered, well, Brian McMahon was the dominant figure. If I had to mention other people, I would ask your permission to mention a group of people, my so-called students, Several of them were even then, let alone now, better, more educated, more insightful than myself, but still they were the ones through their interactions that I managed to follow the tremendous developments in epidemiology since the early 1970s until now. And of course that's just another example of what a generous person Demetrius was. Um, but it's, it's also a sentiment that I've come to appreciate more and more because mentoring is really a two-way process, and I'm sure I've learned as much from my mentees as they have learned from me. N Nature bestows annual awards now for mentoring in science, as do a lot of other organizations, including the American College of Epidemiology. But there's still no established definition of what constitutes good scientific mentoring. And there's current thinking and tools that we use as mentors now, like individual development plans or IDPs, 
and progress reports, and these are mentioned in this Nature's Guide for Mentors. Um, personally, Demetrius and I never had a progress meeting, probably because I worked with him for eight hours a day, and if he didn't like something, I'm sure he'd tell me right away. Um, and I often <laughs> wonder what he'd think about an IDP. Um, so uh, there are some other mentoring characteristics that were mentioned in this article and in others that I hope are timeless and that we really need to continue with. I selected some that here that remind me of Demetrius. Those are respect and that's mutual respect between the mentor and the mentee and unselfishness on the part of the mentor being widely read and widely receptive to new ideas or to challenges and that a mentor, a good mentor, is often a mentor for life. And that he or she sees their interactions with people as lifelong. You know, my own children in this slide, you can see them. Um, they loved and respected Demetrius and he loved them. And I know that's the case for everyone on this panel. So I think now about how to serve our fellows here at NCI, and they were recently surveyed about the mentoring that they received, and some of the data are shown here. A proportion of our fellows still have some gaps in terms of some important qualities in their mentors. Um, these are some gaps that, for example, myself or my director could fill in. and. In this day and age, really, it's a good idea to have multiple mentors who are serving different roles in one's development. The, the thing that's a little bit more tricky is that about over 40% of our fellows, they feel like they don't know how to be a mentor when they leave their postdoctoral fellowship. Unfortunately, um, this is something that's hard to help <laughs> them with. Mentoring is something you learn best from example and then from practice, from being a mentor. Um, they'd love a road map, they'd love a flow chart, um, or they'd love an app, frankly. Um, but that's something that I can't give them. What we seem to know is that bad mentoring is bad and good mentoring is good. and that good mentoring is a predictor of academic success, although we don't necessarily understand what good mentoring involves or how to be good mentors, and part of this coming from this, this paper in Annals of Epidemiology, uh, as, it, as mentoring relates to public health training, this isn't necessarily discouraging to me because mentoring and great mentoring may be intangible, um, but it's real. And Demetrius tended to follow a traditional mentoring model, and that's described in the literature usually as one-on-one -on -one mentoring or mentees that are molded in the image of the mentor. Sometimes it's talked about in a disparaging way in that sense. But I think that there was a lot to gain from a tradi traditional mentoring model. Um, but it is rare and, and maybe not feasible in a lot of today's academic environments, which is why I, I brought up the model of having multiple mentors serving different roles. Informally, Demetrius showed me by example so much about mentoring, and that's the foundation that I carry with me today. At the same time, we're always learning, and the field of scientific education is a new area of formal learning for me, um, and especially to keep up with it as it evolves. I have referred, for example, to, to this um, seminar series, Entering Mentoring. One of the authors of this is Joe Handelsman, and she's the Associate Director for Science at the White House Office of Science and Technology Policy. She's a biologist and received the Presidential Award for Excellence in Science Mentoring in 2011. And she also um, is of the mindset that effective mentoring can be learned, but it can't be taught, and that good mentors discover their own objectives and methods and style by mentoring. So um, although 
Uh, that's true. The purpose of these seminars is to sort of speed that process up of becoming a good mentor um, by using insights from experienced mentors. And so sometimes I feel like I have one foot in this new world of scientific education that may have some new insights, but I have one foot very firmly grounded in, in really the essentials and what I consider immutable basics of the mentor-mentee relationship that are ingrained in me from Demetrius. And you can take a look at this almost 200-page book, and it really distills down to the same things that I think we're really talking about, that there are things that we expect from our mentees, and that can boil down to just really hard work. And I think we would all agree, the mentees on this panel, that Demetrius expected really hard work from us. And that what to expect of yourself as a mentor, that list is longer. <laughs> and, and that's why it's such a commitment to be a mentor that we should set bars very high for ourselves as role models, make serious commitments to our mentees, always think about opening doors for our mentees. And, and to highlight this next point, you know, sharing experiences, insights, and process, we were allowed to see the things that Demetrius did and how he did them. We saw how he ran his projects, we saw how he wrote, we saw how he made his decisions. And so we apprenticed under him in that way and gained so much valuable information in the process. And that comes from spending time with mentees. Um, mentors need to have their best interests of the, of the mentees at heart and to also be a safe place. With heartfelt irony, I tell you that mentor is a Greek word. It's from a character written by Homer. When Odysseus left for the Trojan War, he charged his friend and advisor, mentor, with advising and serving as a guardian to his son. And over time, of course, it's been adopted to refer to a guide, and a guide or a teacher or somebody who imparts wisdom in other settings. Mentoring. Uh, in my profession, in my career now, gives me so much energy. I see it as a privilege. It expands me in new directions. And the single reason I count myself successful in this area is because of Demetrius. I invoke him in my discussions with my fellows nearly every day. And through all of our work, everyone on this panel and everyone in this room, I think that his legacy in mentoring will reach farther than he could even have expected. Thank you very much.